Who remembers where you were 21 years ago on this date? I might ask Lambert to share this story. I'm putting him on the spot here again that he shared at the first service where he was on that date and what happened in your life. Um, I was in Vancouver visiting uh, family and was scheduled to fly out that morning and my uncle woke us up. He was going to take us to the airport and said, you guys aren't going anywhere and um, obviously watch what happened. Um, I was living in New York and working in New York at the time and so we stayed a day or two and then the anxiety of just wanting to see friends and get back um, became overwhelming and it, we, there was no way to know when flights would be resumed. So we took the rental car, drove to Seattle um, and then rented another car and just drove across the country glued to, this is sort of before the day of real cell phones or what these smartphones, but kind of just glued to the radio, um, kind of making stops. I, I, it was hard to sleep, so I think there was days where you just drive 16 hours kind of um, wondering how everyone was, was doing. Because was, there wasn't any text messages between friends. This, that, it's so funny too that, that life has changed so much that it would have been a completely different experience with a smartphone. Um, and it wasn't, it was, we really didn't have smartphones then. So it was a very, I guess a more analog experience versus the way we're all having these digital experiences. But I'm thankful for that too, in a way. But you had no idea where your friends in New York were or how they had fared or anything yeah. like that. Anybody else want to tell us where you were when you saw what was happening in the world or what was going on or heard the news? Yes, Lisa. Anyone else want to share? Yes, Mike.
Wow. How many of you remember it like it was yesterday? You can go back to that moment immediately because of the pain of that moment. I was in West Virginia at the time serving at Hedgesville United Methodist Church, and my mom happened to be out spending a couple days with me. My husband was away on a corporate retreat with his office workers, and we happened to be watching the Today Show. And immediately they said, there's been an accident at the World Trade Center. There's smoke coming out, and we're getting reports. It was Katie Kirk and Matt Lauer. They were saying that we think it was an airplane that hit the trade tower. They thought it was an accident. And while my mother and I were watching live, we saw the second plane hit the second tower. And I remember the sick realization that it was not an accident. It could not be an accident that two planes hit at the same time. Then within minutes, you know, things started happening around the country. The Pentagon, the plane on its way to Pennsylvania, or that was on its way to hit the Capitol that was taken down in Pennsylvania. And that horrible feeling of what has happened, you felt like the rug was pulled out from under you, didn't you? Now, my husband was on his corporate retreat, made it to a phone, and called me. And he said, I remember when I told you I'd never order you to do anything? And I said, yep. And he said, I'm ordering you to stay home today. Because I had a meeting in Baltimore that was already canceled. But there were no cars on the roads. And people were scrambling to figure out what was going on and what happened. Now, I, was, I had a hair appointment that morning, too, and my hairdresser called and said, don't leave me here alone, come hold my hand. So I sat with him, and we watched television, literally holding this guy's hand. And that evening, we went to church. Did you all come here to church that evening? Did churches around the country open their doors? And that next Sunday, the Sunday following September 11th, was the largest attendance in Christian churches in the United States in the history of the United States. People of all different colors and nationalities showed up at church looking for hope and healing. Now, the passage we just read was one that I read that evening to my congregation. Now, we didn't say who said those words, but you recognize them. Don't you? They were from the Sermon on the Mount. Who, who said, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I say to you, do not resist an evildoer. Who said those words? I'll give you a hint. Sermon on the Mount. Tall guy, beard. Jesus. Remember him? These are words that we know very well, right? You all know the Sermon on the Mount. You've heard it so many times, but doesn't it take on a different meaning when you're hearing it? Do not resist an evildoer. If anyone strikes you on the right cheek, turn the other also. You've heard it said, love your neighbor, hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Tough things to be asked to do when the nation is in crisis and the nation is under attack. But I think that's how we survive when these things happen. We survive by turning to Christ. We survive by going to the source of our life and our life eternal, the source of our hope and our healing. And even when it's tough to do this, we've got to turn to Jesus Christ. One of the persons that I asked to speak to us this morning is Kevin Bannister, who's a member of this congregation. He's in Boston, or he'd be here this morning. Kevin was one of the people who went to the World Trade Center to do recovery work as a responder. Not a first responder, because he had to get up there. But he was there and contracted cancer, as did many of the people who were working there because of the, the debris and the number of toxins and that rubble and things like that. But he worked there without fail. So this morning, we're going to remember the people who were part of the healing and part of the hope. We're going to commit ourselves to working as people of peace and of uh, righteousness and justice. God requires justice of us, not justice in making other people pay for their crimes. That's in God's hands. But I want us to think this morning about all those folks who are the ones who respond when there's an accident. Every time I hear a siren, I stop. Every single time I stop what I'm doing. If I'm driving, I don't close my eyes, but I pray to God. I pray, God, protect the ones they're going to help, protect the ones going to offer the help. It's very difficult, isn't it? Because we have a country that's torn apart by so many things right now. So as this anniversary rolls by, there's a lot of pain, isn't there, in our lives? What are the other things in the world that are crying out for us to love our enemies? What are the things that are making enemies with us right now? The war in Ukraine 
I talked to Anna and Nathan Glenn this week. I talked to Anna, really. They're having trouble with their chicken feed that they'd been selling in Liberia because they cannot get corn because of the war in Ukraine. We tend to think here that it's all about us and our gas prices going up and inflation being something that's hitting the United States. It is a worldwide problem right now because of that war. And people are still struggling. And they're coming up on winter. And their winter is longer and harder than ours in that part of the world. It's hard to look at that, isn't it? It's hard to look at children suffering and wonder, what am I supposed to do, God? There's racial divide in this nation. And I know folks who are afraid to call 911 because they're afraid of the police. And that's not good either. I shared at the first service something that happens in my line of work is that there are pastors and priests who have abused people, have abused sexually abused children, have abused other folks in other ways. And someone asked me once, what's the worst part of being in the ministry? And I said that you're, you're as good as your last mistake. Sometimes we're as good as the last mistake as somebody holds the same office we hold. I have a lot of African-American friends. Every last one of them has been stopped and harassed by a police officer at some point. We've got to get beyond this time of thinking that everyone is out to get us, because not every police officer is like that. There are police officers who are trained just like first responders who are EMTs, first responders who are firefighters. They will put their lives on hold and run to that building. You remember seeing that, don't you, when you turn on the television, the people escaping, but who is running toward the problem? It's the police and the firefighters. We have to learn to lift up those who are doing good, but not forget the ones who do what is not right in God's eyes. We need to pray for them as well so that all of us get to the point where we can say God is our source, our hope, our healing. We're going to follow God no matter what. So this morning, let us remember with joy and thanksgiving the people who helped as we go through this service of remembrance. May it also be for us a time of healing and hope, because if we just remember and let our anger grow in us, we will want retribution and revenge, but that's not what we're called to do in Christ's name. So I'm going to ask now for Anne to come forward, and we'll go through our service a little bit more together. <laughs>